Hey everyone, I am so grateful that my wonderful friend Pete Murphy is coming in to join me for a chat. He's an absolute seasoned pro when it comes to the entertainment industry. He's lived all over the world and he came back to Australia to do The Voice. He shared the stage with many people and has experienced it all. It's just incredible. It's absolutely endless and he's a world full of knowledge and I'm so grateful that he's here to share his journey with you. Hi Pete, welcome. Hi, how you doing? really well how are you good this is a bit of fun I know right you're finally on my show this is fantastic I know. we've talked about it for a long time and now we're doing it so. I know and you're a really good supporter too so thank you for that I'm really grateful for that so thank you of course it's amazing what you do so I'm really happy to be here well let's kick it off let's kick it off so let's just uh give everyone a little bit of a rundown of how it got started for you in this industry I mean it's I started really young I like I was really lucky enough to have an awesome family and sister and my sister was doing ballet and I was three years old and I, I asked to do ballet. They, they weren't pumped with me being a ballerina, but you know, I really loved it. So I started when I was three and, and uh, did that for a lot of years. And then uh, when I was nine started singing and then when I was 10 turned pro. <laughs> wow. At 10 years old. Was that your, yeah, we, wow. It was like a really bad uh, TV show up here that was like a ripoff of um, Young Talent Time. <laughs> and, uh, and I started doing that. So and then every holidays I would spend doing shows. So, you know, I started at 10 just performing all the time and haven't really stopped since. <laughs> no, you haven't. You really haven't stopped. And was there any courses that you did like, you know, late teens or young adulthood, was there, because you know how a lot of people, um, once they, you know, graduate like from school, they end up doing a full-time course or whatever. Like, how was that for you? Did you have to do any of that or did were you just I did actually I, immerse in the industry? I did actually go straight into uh, a Bachelor of Arts in acting at QT, but at the end of the first year, it just really wasn't the place for me. It wasn't right for me. Yeah. And the way they approached it was was wasn't really working for me you know because different strokes for different folks so um but I, I really wanted people to uh inspire me and tell me and, and teach me and they wanted us to do it and I was like well I don't feel like I'm there yet you know that's why I'm here so mm. so I, I dropped out of that at the end of uh the first year and just started doing cover bands and stand-up comedy and that sort of stuff and just performing so yeah cool that's so cool and I mean and then what, what age were you are you started track I mean because you did immerse yourself into the industry and you did a lot of shows because uh, like I know about them but um tell us more about your musical theater background like what was more of your passion like let's say was it going into music or producing or musical theater like what what was your thing that you wanted most of all I guess music's always been my thing and and you know beautiful voices and amazing performances is kind of you know where what what made you want to be in the industry in the first place and uh, but I remember seeing shows like uh, Les Miserables and Cats when I was really young and just being amazed that they were even possible. Yeah. Um, and uh, musical theatre, I'd done a few things as a, as, a, as a child, like a few things up here with opera, Queensland and Australian opera and that sort of stuff, but, but not a lot in that sort mm. of realm. And then uh, there was a newspaper, art, a newspaper audition back then yeah, that's, it was <laughs> yep, that that's, that's the area. Yep. <laughs> because they were having trouble signing the person they wanted to, to, to do Marius in Les Miserables. And so I went to an audition out of the newspaper and I was the only callback in Queensland. And the guy who was sitting there like filming it, I thought for the producers was, it was just was said, said to me like, why have you never seen you before? And I said, oh, I haven't auditioned for anything before. And, yeah. Um, and so yeah, he got me to do all this stuff. He sent me away with a, the full orchestral score, which, you know, not really reading music. I just fumbled through and went, okay, I'm going to figure this out. And, you know, the song was um, In My Life, which also changes time signature like every two bars. So I was yeah. really just sitting there like for like five hours while everyone else did their auditions, just going, okay, this is what you're going to sing. And then and back then the internet what didn't really exist that much. So you couldn't just listen to it and stream it over and over again. I was just... <laughs> Yeah, like full and went back in and sang it. And they recorded it and sent it out. And that guy who was there filming it happened to be Chris Green, who's you know a fantastic producer, a wonderful guy in the industry. And and um, he called me like a week or so later and said, "Oh, look, we ended up signing the person that we had been trying to sign. So there is no role, but 
um, we need a swing. Would you consider swinging? And I said, I don't even know what a swing is, but sure, you know. So yeah. that was my first gig in, in adult musical theatre was swinging Les Mis What a show to kick it off, though. Like, that's rock. an incredible Absolutely. show. Wow. Absolutely. And still, and still to this day, my favourite show to watch. Like, I, I, it's such a complete work of art, you know. It's a... It, people criticise the little recitative melodies and stuff, but I, I don't know. There's something so wonderfully crafted about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a classic. It's like those musicals, you know. It's just a classic and you can't yes. ever fault it in any way. Well, for us personally because we love it, but, you know, other people can, like you yeah. said. But, yeah, I think and from there on did it just kind of roll because, you know, sometimes once we land our first show, then we get to the next and the next. Like how did it go after Les Mis for you? Yeah. It really was like that. And the, as I said, um, Chris Green, who's in that first room, is, you know, a wonderful man and, and, and really dialed into the industry. So he then uh, made me audition for Rent, which was also with uh, Cam, Mac, Cam, sorry, Cam McIntosh Productions. So, um, and then put me in that and I swung that as well. And then he was casting a show called Fame. So each of these shows, I left essentially to go and do the next show. And he was casting Fame and said, look, we've got this role we haven't been able to cast. It's the last day of auditions fly down today to Sydney and do this audition and I flew down did it in Sydney flew back that night and did the show in Melbourne of um wow. of rent and um they called me the next morning and said oh yeah you've got the role on so you know that that's where it went and then they that was with um with uh Jacobson's so mm-hmm. then Jacobson's put me into shout and I covered shout and then I took over shout and then I covered shout again for someone else and then you know so it really was just a, a rolling on of, yeah. of these things and, and just wonderful people looking out for for me you know so I've been very fortunate yeah that's and it's so nice isn't it because I think a lot of people have a stigma when it comes to uh this industry and they think you know you're in it on your own no one's going to help you out you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but I think there are a lot of people that open the doors you know and and I think you know we should honor that and talk about that because again it's getting rid of that stigma to think that this industry it is a tough industry we all know that um because there's a lot of hard work and dedication and a lot of the time what i say is like if we don't have that passion to drive us each and every day to do it then we don't we just don't last you know um but because it's tough it's the in-betweens that are the toughest not when you're actually in a show but i do think that we should honor the fact that people do you know, really support one another and, and yeah, we, we help each other out, I believe. Yeah. And I mean, most people's journey isn't like mine. I'm, I'm, I really have been very fortunate and these wonderful people who, you know, you think that it's just cutthroat, but these people who have looked out for me and over the years and that sort of stuff. Um, but I mean, at one stage, I think I I'd, I'd had done seven shows and three auditions. Yeah. Wow. You know, and I've just been put Incredible. in the other shows by these people. So you know, it's, and I know that's not everybody's journey. Some people do a hundred auditions and get one show, you know, um, yeah. but then that show may be the biggest thing you've ever seen. So, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing and it's different for everybody. But, um, but I, I really admire the people who, who turn up every day and keep doing it and slog through it and, you know, do the hard work, mm. you know, rather than just what the public sees, which is like, Oh, this guy's a brickie and he, and he sings a song really pretty he deserves a break no uh, people who who spend 20 years turning up to auditions and getting no's even though they're fantastic and they hone their arts and they go to class and they do all that sort of stuff I think those those are the people who really we should admire and we should really should you know absolutely it's a shame, that they, it's a shame that they don't get the, the credit they deserve so that's right. I agree because it is it is tough. And a lot of the time, um, you know, I, I say this a lot again, but how a lot of people just think and assume that our lives as performing artists, are, it's just so glamorous. And wow, how, you know, what, what it's like to be up on that stage and under the lights. It's like, yeah, but you know how long it took me to get there? You know, like the training, like we, we've started from kids. We literally have been in training our whole life to land a certain role or whatever that may be. And then we don't know how long that's guaranteed for. That could be the first and last thing you ever do as a performing artist as well. I mean, I was I left um, the first tour of Shout to do the Arena Spectacular of Hair, which you guys probably never heard of because it it shut a week before rehearsal started. <laughs> like wow. they cancelled it because the ticket sales had been so low. 
and they couldn't go ahead because the arena, the arena crowds are just thousands. Like you just can't compare to just, you know. And, and uh, what I'd heard, which is may- maybe totally untrue, is that in the first week of sales, they sold 7,000 tickets, which is not even one show. So, you know, you launch an, an arena spectacular, you can't go on those numbers. So, but who knows if that's true or not, because people, you know, we all make things up that sound good. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, I'm sure that's true along the way, but that's okay. So after your 100 auditions, you know, you might get into the hair, the arena spectacular, and then it cancels a week before rehearsals, you know. Yeah. It's incredible that... Uh, that entertainment producers bother to produce entertainment, to be honest, mm. because the risk is so high, often the rewards are so low, they're the employers that, you know, they make all the money and that sort of stuff. But that, you know, I mean, they must truly love the arts to take that risk and to do all of that work because it really is a lot of work. As someone who produces things myself, it's, it's an astounding amount of work for very little credit and often very little reward financially, you know, but they still do it. Yeah. And those, those people, I, f- I find them amazing as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, I feel like, uh, yeah, like I said, it's just, it, it's everyone. It's it's how it all comes together. It's not just everybody up on stage. It's the production. It's the crew. It's, it's everybody that is literally working so hard around the clock all the time to make it look effortless and wonderful, you know, for everyone to come and sit and watch, you know. But yeah. I think, yeah, credit definitely is due to everybody that is a part of anything to do with the arts because it's a, yeah, it's a tough one, but we love it. What, what was the, the last show you did before you left the country? <laughs> Look, I'm terrible at remembering what happened in what order and what years. Like, you know, there's people that go, oh, yeah, that was, uh, that was 92 and we did such and such. And I'm like, I have no idea what year anything happened and <laughs> yeah. often what order they happened in. So, I mean, I did a lot of stuff. Um, the musical director of Shout, I was not a Shout, sorry, of Rent, um, is, a, is a guy called John Ma. Um, and he uh, he moved to Britain. So then I would periodically get phone calls from John Ma saying, hey, um, do you think you could fly to London tomorrow uh, and come and do this production of Jesus Christ Superstar? And hey, do you think you could fly to London tomorrow and do this production of, of this tour of um, Thrill Alive? And you know, so I did Jesus Christ Superstar over there and in Scandinavia with him. And then I did Thrill Alive, did four different tours of Thrill Alive and did it on the West End for a short time as well. And then while I was doing Thrill Alive in um, in Glasgow, um, a friend of mine contacted me and said, you know, they're looking for a lead in Will Rock You on the West End. And I'd done Will Rock You in Japan twice um, for another amazing producer called Louise Withers and Associates. Fantastic producer. Um, and uh, and I went, oh, okay. So I, I didn't have any contacts. So I found the email, the, sorry, the website for the musical director and emailed him and said, hey, look, I know this isn't the right way to do it, but I ha- don't know how else to go about it. I've done this role here. I hear that you're looking for a Galileo. Yep. You know, is there any chance? And I appreciate if it, if this, if if you can't help me out. And he wrote the next day and said, yeah, of course, I'll, I'll forward it to the producers and they'll get on to you. And the casting director called me that afternoon and, and, uh, and I went down, so I did the show Thrill Alive in Glasgow that night, and then I got on a midnight train from Glasgow to London, got in at 7 a.m., had a 9 a.m. audition, and then got on the midday train back up to Glasgow to do the show that night. Oh, my goodness. So Alive, <laughs> Your so. pattern is to travel in the morning, go back at night. <laughs> <It's a show>. <laughs> like <laughs> you've got a good pattern going here. <laughs> That's actually probably the weirdest, like, experience of my life, you know, fatigued and, you know, from that weird you know you don't sleep well on those nights either particularly no. on a train um and and i i walked into the room and it was the final round of auditions so i was literally walking into that last audition mm. um and sitting there with there was five people there there was the md and then there was s- someone else filming and then ben elton brian may and roger taylor and that was the room that i walked into and i was like Okay, here we go. (laughs) That woke you up. (laughs) And and it was just from there, it it was just the bizarrest morning of my life. And I started out, they said, what do you want to start with? I said, oh, whatever you like. And they said, oh, let's sing I Want to Break Free. So I sang that. At the end of it, Ben Elton stood up and he went, you know, that's exactly what that's supposed to sound like, isn't it? And he said, Brian May and Roger Taylor, and they nodded and they went, it's nice to finally hear it. And I was like, Thank you. That. And then so we did a whole heap of scene work and then we did We Will Rock You and We Are The Champions and then they went, thanks very much, see you. And they're like, see you later. And I'm like, I called my best friend straight after and I said, okay, 
one of two things has happened. Either I just killed that or I'm that guy who just walked out and thought he killed that and they were like, oh, my God, that was so embarrassing because it was just <laughs> the strangest you never know. thing. You never know when it comes to the panel. Nope. And then the next morning they called me and offered me the role. This is also That's a pattern amazing. for me. So, so I was glad that they did it that quickly because I was really not, I was going, I don't know if I'm just that guy. Who's yeah, gone, you would have had so much angst nailed. trying to like work like, it out. <laughs> and they were like, okay, what else do we have? You know, so. No, that's awesome. And did you spend a lot of your time overseas more than Australia, so to speak? It varied, you know, like it, it, I guess there are a lot more opportunities overseas, a lot more shows happening. You know, it's just our population here doesn't support enough and we don't really have an international tourism industry of travelling here for shows like you do with the West End or with Vegas or with New York City, you know, those sorts mm. of places that people will come from all over the world to watch a show there. Yeah. Um, I mean, Melbourne could be that place, you know, if we could find a way to, to, to have that many shows going on and sustain them after this awful period of history, you know, yes. <laughs> if we could sustain them long enough to, to, to attract that international market, you know, yeah, it's, so true. <laughs> it's hard to get them here in the first place, you know, because Absolutely. Melbourne in that like, two square kilometres, there are like 14 theatres. Yeah. It's a wonderful city in that way. Like it's a sensational setup that we've got there. Yeah. It's just about, you know, I guess I guess we need, you know, $10 billion in marketing worldwide to, to let people know. To get it happening. Yeah, I know. I to mean, start like. It off, and- but then, then we could yeah. be, you know. That's it. Absolutely. I agree. I mean, like Melbourne reminds me, sometimes it reminds me of New York because like I've gone to New York just to watch shows and, you know, have a bit of a holiday, you know, things like that. And, but I think because, uh, you know, going to New York, there's, there's a lot of shows that will never come here. So you want to have that opportunity to be able to see an incredible production over there because you know that it's, it, you know, or even if it does make it to Australia, it's not going to be for another 10 years <laughs> or something like that, yeah. you know. <laughs> But I mean, if you do that walk of the centre of Sydney, of, of sorry, of Melbourne, and if from the art centre up to the Prinny and then down past the Comedy and the Regent, and the, like it's it's amazing how much arts infrastructure there is. You know, it's a 100%. So, you know, maybe in the future, fingers crossed. Maybe we'll recover yeah. it. <laughs> we'll we'll just keep putting it out there. <laughs> but you know, it, this is a great time to actually think differently about stuff. You know, we've basically everything's fallen in a heap. What we do have is kind of limping along when it can, you know, and I don't mean the shows at all. The shows are fantastic shows, yeah. but, you know, as far as being open and that sort of stuff where they're limping along. Remaining um, open, that's the thing. We open and then it closes and we open and then, yeah. and then they just shut it down. But so. audiences and now we casts and, you know, you know, it's, it's been a real challenge for them and, and, again, amazing that these people are not just pulling the plug and leaving when they are losing a lot of money and they are doing everything they can to sustain these shows. You know, it's, it's, it's really great to see. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I want to ask you as well, do you, do you feel like moving overseas for you, um, do you think that really helped you professionally and personally or, you know, did, did one outweigh the other? Because I know, you know, sometimes when we make a move and we travel overseas, you know, it helps us really mature and just uh, think differently. I think for anybody, you know, different, very more varied influences is always a good thing yeah. i find most people who are narrow-minded are people who've never done much so the more we tend to experience the more open-minded we are mm. i mean that's obviously if you have total negative experiences it's probably the opposite of that but mm-hmm. in general i find you know that traveling that being exposed to other cultures and realizing that those people who you always thought were so weird just prioritize different things and yeah. and you know and value different things from you. And that's okay because you're not necessarily right. You're just, you know, living your life. Everyone's just trying to get home, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I think it is really important to, you know, as a cultural thing as well, just to get out there as much as you can. I know it's tougher these days than what it used to be, but I think um, generally like in, within this industry, I think it's so important to experience working overseas and completely throwing yourself out of that comfort zone that, you know, like you think, oh, good, I know how it works here and I know the circle and I've got my people and all of that. But I really do think it's so important to say, you know what, 
I'm just going to think left of field for a sec and I'm going to jump on that plane and go. And a lot of people have done that and it has been the best thing they've ever done in their life. Saying that they, you know, that you don't know what you don't know is, is epically true. And when you, and so, you know, learning and just when you go to those places, don't just go with your state of mind and, and try to force that onto the place that you're in, like yeah. go and try to, you know, let the, the place you're in affect you and influence you and teach you something and, Totally. You know, when, yeah. when I was teaching a lot of, uh, I used to have students of different talent levels and, you know, a lot of dance students who were terrified of singing and a lot of people in that. And I'd hear them talk about certain teachers and stuff and, and some of them, because you know, a lot of us are, are a little bit arrogant in our industry. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, yeah, oh and this teacher's, this teacher's not even good and doesn't know anything. And I, say, I, I used to say to them, look, everybody that you experience has something that can teach you. Like, even if you think you're better than the person teaching you, they, I guarantee you there's something they have that could help make you better. So you or your parents or whoever's paying for this, you know, if you've spent a lot of money on this, find that stuff, like learn from it, like gain something from it. But that's up to you. You can gain something or you can go in there with a terrible attitude and go, hmm, you know, and it's, it's totally you are in control of what you learn and what you experience and how you experience it and how you let it affect you. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I agree. Well, I'm going to yeah, ask you same. actually, like I think when, when it comes to experience, this is going to be very different because then you, from overseas, you moved back and you went on to The Voice. So I had someone who was involved with it who kept saying, you should come and do this and who uh, I trusted and still trust, like, um, that had my best interests at heart and thought it would be good for me and that sort of stuff. And so I took that advice and I met with the producers and, and it seemed like a, like a, like a decent plan. Um, yeah. I, as soon as I got there, I realized I probably had made a mistake, but, but uh, it's not a place for professionals. It's a place for people uh, wanting a break, you know, mm. and I got my breaks. And so it wasn't really a place that, that, that I should have been, you know, I, I should have been happy with the breaks I'd had. And, and I was also, should have, also should have been happy not being a performer anymore. You know, I was, yeah. I was enjoying not being a performer, but I'd come back from, um, uh, from show directing over at the Universal Studios in Singapore and, and didn't really have anything going on. So I was like, well, okay, well, you know, looks like I might have to sing for my supper again for a little while. So <laughs> you know, that's remind people. Sing for your supper. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it did that, you know, it did remind people I was alive. I got, a, you know, a lot of people contacted me about stuff and sadly mainly about John Farnham stuff and which is like the joke of my whole life. But um, <laughs> I know the comparison. I mean, because your voice is amazing and this is the thing that you would hear a lot of the time, like everyone would go, oh, sounds like Johnny Farnham. And, you know, so it's it's very hard and I would say that, you know, you want to be your own person when it comes to being an artist and not being compared to somebody else, you know, that's iconic as well. And it's always that expectation, but, you know, I think it is a compliment because he's amazing, but, you know, and so are you, but you're both individuals, you know, in your own right. So I can understand from that perspective as well for you. I also think, you know, in Australia, if you hit a high rich note as a man, Everyone's you know, thought that sounds like fun and because it's what we would, you know, we've been programmed for this one big, amazing voice that we all know, yeah. you know, so I, th I think it, you're destined to do that. And I mean, I can do fun, but I, I don't, not every note that comes out of my mouth sounds like fun by any means, you know, and, and I, I'd never seen him live until um, uh, a few years ago. And I went and saw him on one of those, uh, a day on the green concerts and he was 69 years old and he was just, I could not believe the notes that that man was singing yeah. at 69. I'm going, wow, like I actually want to quit. Like this is silly. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, um, wow. so, so, you know, it's a, it's a huge compliment, but um, mm. not so much to him, but, you know. I, I know, like I said, I think it's, it is hard to always have that uh, comparison and then for people to say the same thing and you're like, yep, this has been the story of my life. Yep, that's right. Yep, that's the name I hear all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was the great thing about going overseas too is that no one knows who John Farnham is anywhere but Australia. So uh, so there I could just sing and they just go, oh, you know, that's great for this reason or that's terrible for this reason. You know, I did some bad shows as well. <laughs> yeah, well, we all have. <laughs> I mean, we're not perfect. So, and that's Again, good. So How refreshing for you, though, just to have a bit of a breakaway from that yeah. stigma. 
So yeah, it's good. But I say that to students as well. Like when I'm teaching them singing and stuff, I say, look, honestly, I promise you, I have sung better than you're going to sing in any of these lessons. And I have sung worse than you're going to sing in any of these lessons. Like I have stood in front of a crowd and just sounded terrible. I remember one night in, um, in Fame the Musical, we were in Newcastle. And I didn't know, but I had acute pharyngitis. And I just, because, you know, as performers, if we went off every time we were feeling a little down, we would be off all the time. So yeah, that's right. we turn up and we do the show, but then it goes down a little bit more. It goes down a little bit more. And I turned up and I had to start act two in this terrible, like, tux, this, the worst tux you could buy. Um, and by myself, walk straight down the stage um, in, the, in the dark, like with one, just a spotlight in my face saying this Shakespearean monologue and then go into like a reprise of, of the song that I sang in that show. And I had no voice at all. And I just, so I started singing and then I went, oh, maybe up high. Cause you know, sometimes you've got something there. And I tried that it didn't work. I went, oh, maybe down low, I went down there. It didn't work at all. And at the end, I just looked at the audience and I went, and they laughed and I walked off stage. It was like a terrible, bad dream. And yet, Wow. The best thing about performing is there are no consequences apart from you feel stupid, you know, but yeah. no one gets killed. You just lose some self-esteem for a short period of time. Oh, yeah. And then I was off for a week, but, you know. Oh, wow. Like, and what a way to go, oh, maybe it's time to take a bit of a rest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We just do what we do. But, you know, I'd love to ask you, because I know, like you were saying, you coach and you teach and, you you know, you, you help people along their way too um, as young young performers and artists, but is there any advice that you would give them at all? I feel like we give advice so freely and we feel like we're so clever and we do all that sort of stuff, but it's really different for each person. Absolutely. And sometimes yeah. I find myself saying things four different ways before I see something click with the person. Like it, it's our brains all just work different ways and, and we actually want different things as well. So I have to say, I can't give one piece of advice. <laughs> you can give as guess, much advice as you want. <laughs> I, I guess the it. best thing I can say is just, you know, let it go. Let it go. Let everything go. You, your wins and your failures, and they don't matter anymore. Like, it's what you do next. Like, it's, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. What are you doing now? Like, what, what are you doing now? And what do you want next? Because if you want something next, you can't just go, oh, well, I wish that would happen. It's not like entering... You know, well, I guess it is like entering the lottery. Get in it. Like, buy a ticket. You know, unfortunately, this ticket means a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of heartbreak and that sort of stuff. But, you know, you've got to be in it to win it. Yeah. <laughs> so get out there. Don't just hope it happens. Like, start doing those things. Like, the number of times I contacted people and said, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? That sort of stuff. And, yes, I got handed a lot of breaks. But a lot of them came from me contacting people I knew were doing things and saying, hey, how's it going? You know, I'm not doing anything at the moment. What's going on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. It's a give and take, isn't it? Like, you know, I think uh, as much as we always say, oh, you know, I can put it out there and it'll just come to me, but it's co-creating, you know, like so co-create and and that's you reaching out to people to say, hey, I'm back, you know. I, I know like even when I was overseas for a long time, I had been back for so long and then I would randomly bump into someone or whether that was going to an audition or something, they're like, are you back? I was like, I've been back for a year. Like, you know, like it's just there's things that people just assume and you have to do the work to say, hey, guess what? I'm here and and I'm ready, you know, um, yep. and you've got to experience the, the lows with the highs and the in-betweens as you go as well. Stop worrying all the time about what people think of you. They're doing what you're doing. They're walking around worrying what people are thinking of them. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you're going to make people think of you and you've got to, I, I'm not saying you should use people in the industry all the time and that sort of stuff by any means, but allow your friends to help you. Yeah. Like, but they're not thinking about you. They're thinking about what they have to do. So remind them that you're there. And if you're right for it, then they, they have the option to, you know, invite you to be a part of it. Yeah. But, you know, and apart from that, go to the auditions. Like, <laughs> turn yeah, up be a part of it, get amongst it, really. As someone who has an audition a lot, <laughs> I know it's a little, a little bit hypocritical, but, but you know, go to them. If you want it, then chase it. It's the only way to get it. Yeah. And auditions too, it, it's, it, um, it kind of ripens everything for you because you get to experience each audition presents itself with something different. So they're not all going to be the same. Um, yes, they can be very generic in the sense of like, you know, what order you have to do everything in, but it's a different panel. It's different people, different music, you know, different era that you're auditioning for, like all of that kind of stuff. And I think that the more you do, the better you get as well. 
because yeah. he, auditioning is so nerve wracking as well. And when you don't do, if there's so many things that you have done in between and it hasn't been auditioning for something, you get so nervous by the time you have to audition for the next thing. You know, let's say you've gone into TV and you've done TV for a bit and then all of a sudden you go, I'm going to go back into theatre. But it's, again, it's a completely different thing. So I don't know. I think, yeah, like you said, get amongst it and be a part of it and enjoy the ride, I think, as well. And, I mean, there's the other side of it as well where it's, it's sometimes it is the same panel and it is those same people. But the more they see you, the more they know you. And the more they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we saw this girl and she was almost good enough for this. I mean, you know, and yeah. she wasn't quite right, but maybe for this. And they start to know you and knowing you is a, is a great thing. And since you have a connection with you, they feel a responsibility towards you. Mm. Um, good way to put and it. also I feel like I feel like audiences, panels, people are always, always so intimidated by them. But the fact is every audience wants you to be good. Every panel wants you to be good. No one goes into it going, gee, I hope this person's crap. You know, <laughs> yeah. no one buys a $130 yeah. ticket to a show hoping it's going to suck. You know, everyone's actually on your side until you lose them. So, you know, you walk in and the panel's going, oh, gee, I hope this person's great. And then you have the opportunity to be great. You know, it's, it's, it's you've got to think of it that way. It's, they're, they're not there to judge you and throw you out. Mm, that's a nice way but, to put um, it. It's a good way to think about it because your nerves can get the better of you and all of a sudden it just all of the that thought process that you're just saying can go out the window but that is a really good thing to think about i would say that they're there to support you and want to yeah. you know, for you to do well which is really good yeah yeah and i mean i also have a, a a different perspective being a male singer than if you were a female dancer where i'm going up against maybe 10 other 30 other guys max you know for a role Whereas a female dancer is going up against maybe 2,000 people in some of these bigger shows, you know, yeah. and there are 12 roles and 2,000 girls and we need 12. Yeah. You know, that's, so it's a different perspective. I guess it, I get it that it's more intimidating and it's, it's much worse odds and that sort of stuff. But those girls turn up and they do an amazing job over and over and over again and get told no and still, you know, go on wait tables and come back and do it again. And, you know, I don't know how, how they can be that resilient, but I admire it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I think everyone's got their own journey when it comes to this industry. And, and uh, like we said, you know, you, you take what you can, you know, and however that lasts for you is, you know, that's your journey. But it's been so nice to have a chat to you and have you on my show. I really appreciate you inviting me on. Thank you very much. If you love this interview just as much as I did, I would love for you to subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any notifications when it comes to new episodes, content, and anything to do with Uncensored and Real. And in the description box down below, I'll share the link with you so you can see everything that Uncensored and Real is up to. So you can follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. And also my podcasts are available on Spotify. So I'd love to see you over there too to follow the show. So until next time. Next time. I'll see you then.